This is the second attempt <laughs> at covering everything everywhere all at once. We both, well, we all watched it when it first came out. I was not at all opposed to watching it again. And I gotta say, on my second viewing, I liked it even more than the first time. Well, I'm glad we sat on it because we talked about trying to re-record it after we figured out the recording failed and we were kind of like had that talk about the pros and cons of that first hot take and trying to redo yeah. it. I'm glad we let it simmer for a while, put it on the back burner, waited for the Oscars mm -hmm. because it was good to rewatch it. This is Wang. This is Wang. Mrs. Wang, are you with us? I am paying attention. Now you may only see a pile of receipts, but I see a story. I can see where this story is going. It does not look good. Uh, so everything, everywhere, all at once, star uh, is directed by the, the Daniels, Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinart. Uh, written and directed by them, it stars Michelle Yeoh as Evelyn Wang, Stephanie Su as Joy Wang, Ki Kwan as Waymond Wang, James Hong as Gong Gong, the grandfather, and Jamie Lee Curtis as Deirdre Bubirdra. <laughs> what a beautiful movie this is, honestly. Like. Uh, I, I I struggle to even like start talking about it because there's so much to talk about. But I, what I will start mm -hmm. to say is I first saw the trailer for this. I think I think I saw the trailer for this in theaters when I saw Spider Man No Way Home, and I remember thinking to myself, I like I was like, well, this looks interesting, kind of like fucking wacky. Like, what could this be about? Having no idea whatsoever what it would be about but i don't think anybody really expected this. like i don't there wasn't a lot of noise around this movie normally when a movie opens it's like it got a huge opening and fucking everybody this seemed to have pick up steam like slowly but surely i could be wrong but it seems like it this movie like spread around like via word of mouth like oh have you seen everything everywhere at once no you should check right. it out and it also came out around like a little bit closer to the end of covid so like people were still like warming up to the idea of like going back out to theaters and stuff like that but man i'm glad i watched this at the end of the day um so this is the story of uh this family and <laughs> there's some multiversal stuff not some there's a lot of multiversal stuff i made the oh, joke yeah. back when we watched it this is this is the real multiverse of madness right here fuck that doc yeah. doctor strange shit um, this, movie. This, uh, really everything everywhere all at once when you boil it down it's a comic book movie almost it's like pretty much is uh, but Absolutely it, it is yeah, yeah but it does all the things that that I've and I've been complaining about that's been lacking in the actual comic book movies lately this movie has fucking everything it's got action it's got heart it's got drama it's got fucking uh, just uh, comedy it's, uh, it's got some weird shit it's got some weird wacky stuff that you half the time you're not even really sure what's going on but I gotta say, watching it again a second time, not only did I enjoy it more, but I actually understood it way better. Not that I didn't mm -hmm. understand it when I first watched it. It's not really that hard to understand, but there's little little things that you don't catch the first time you watch a film, obviously, because you, you're figuring out everything. Well, now you're going in with like, all right, I know the plot. I know where it goes. Let me really hone in on the small stuff. But uh, so this is a movie, basically it's about Evelyn and Evelyn, she's not so happy with her life. Let's just say that she's, she's living a bit of a humdrum life. Not, uh, she has a lot of interests and hobbies as her husband Wayman mentions. She likes singing. She likes uh, dancing. She gives singing lessons, but her main job they own and live above a uh, family owned laundromat. She's living her worst life. Yeah, she's kind of not too thrilled with her lot in life. Um, while Waymond, on the other hand, he is a kind, loving, forgiving, and understanding and patient uh, man, as she explains towards the end of the film. And he's just happy being happy, you know, um, living his life, loving his family. And, you know, it seems that this has been the year of movies that frame the importance of appreciating the little things. We've talked about it a lot. Oh, yeah. Lately. Uh, but I don't think any movie does it uh, quite as good as this one does. Basically, what happens throughout the course of the movie, I won't go, like, super in-depth into it, but Evelyn is contacted by an alternate universe version of Waymond 
called Alpha Waymond, because he's from the Alphaverse. And in the Alphaverse, they're dealing with a bit of a crisis. Some supervillain has risen to power, and he's been traveling the multiverse trying to find the Evelyn that could help. And uh, he explains to her that these other universes, or life paths that he calls them, uh, basically, you're able to tap into them. And this is one of the things that I didn't actually realize on my first viewing. Um, I thought she was actually, like, physically going to these places. It's not that. You're tapping into their mind and memories. Yeah. So she's still physically here in the main universe. Correct. So all those scenes where you're seeing the other events play out, she's just... It's a memory to her. Um, yeah. I don't know how I missed that on my first watch, but I now understand that so happy about that but um alpha wayman explains that it's called verse jumping and the movie blends these two very real theories of the multiverse uh in theoretical physics you get the uh the many worlds theory which uh basically suggests that uh for every action there is a it creates an alternative branching timeline it's the same theory that the marvel movies use in their version of the multiverse with the sacred timeline and all the branching timelines and all that there's a split at every decision yeah right and uh but this movie takes that theory and combines it with another multiversal theory called the bubble theory and in that uh that theory suggests that uh you know picture a bottle of soda and every little bubble floating around in there is a universe and that theory goes a step further and when two bubbles collide it creates a another bubble which is a, another universe so this movie blends some of those two things together which i thought was really cool and it makes for some creative stuff in the movie verse jumping as i said allows one to connect to other versions of themselves it allows them to adapt their skills their knowledge etc and in the movie, you have to meet specific parameters in order to successfully jump. So if our character wants to know Kung Fu, she has to imagine a universe where she knows Kung Fu and then do a silly thing to uh, tap into that reality. And we've seen there, something you normally wouldn't do. Yeah. yeah, there's many examples throughout the movie, uh, putting a butt plug up your ass or anything up your ass for that matter eating a stick of fucking uh, chapstick, chapstick. Um, yeah. making yourself sneeze. There's like a lot of fun little silly examples that they do with that. In order for her to know martial arts, I gave an example, but in the film, she has to profess her love for Deidre, which is the IRS agent played by Jamie Lee Curtis. Um, now, this is another thing that I didn't catch the first time around, and I may be wrong, so I wanted to bring it up because I want to know your opinion on it, but... I'm pretty sure when she professes her love for Deidre, she creates the branching timeline where they're in love with the hot dog fingers. Probably, yeah. I don't, I don't know if that's for sure, but I yeah. could see that. They're not clear on it one way or another, but understanding these theories of the multiverse, I, it made sense to me on this second Plausible, viewing yeah. that that's what happened. But every so often throughout the, the narrative of the film, uh, in the midst of all this craziness going on with jumping back and forth, we get, we, we get cuts back to our main universe. And sometimes it's a little confusing. I think it's done on purpose. You don't really know kind of where you are. And then time, sometimes you like clearly know your, you, where you are. Uh, but when we jump back to the main universe, it's basically her dealing with her familial stuff. And, and being audited. And being audited, right. Which is part of the familial stuff, really. We find out that Waymond petitioned for a divorce. He got papers drafted up and everything like that. And it's a really heartbreaking uh, discovery for her. And she doesn't really understand why. And we find out that he wanted a divorce because he hoped that it would spark a little bit of a fire into their marriage. And he says that, you know, we never talk unless it's an emergency. You know, I hope this would basically spark up a conversation for us to fix our marriage. But the heartbreak... Well, he explains another... He was talking to somebody else who... In church. Was having the same troubles mm -hmm. and yeah, got filed for a divorce and it actually sparked a, a positive conversation. Yep. So, But the heartbreaking thing about it really is that because of who he is, as I mentioned, he's like an understanding, like kind and like dedicated husband and just person in general. He's ultimately doing it for her because he feels that she would have been happier had they never gotten married. And he says this to her, um, and she says, I never said that. And he's like, I could just tell the way you look at me. So that's like a really, uh, a really heartbreaking moment. And, and there's another one when she gets a glimpse of her life as an actress, 
which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, she fucking crushes this dude. And she says, I saw my life without you in it. It was beautiful. I should have listened to my father and never gone with you. And he just like mm -hmm. has this little whimper. Oh my God. I'm going to fucking cry talking about it. Yeah, it's pretty cruel. <laughs> I don't even think she meant it to be cruel. I think she was just being honest. It's just, it's, it's, it's a hard thing. I mean, if you, having to hear that on the other end is for sure, it comes off as cruel, but I don't think she meant it as that. Well, she 100% meant it, but. No, I mean, as like cruel. In the middle of her arc, yeah, she comes to the conclusion that, you know, living the life she currently lives, which is mm -hmm. literally her worst life where, Every decision that she could have made, she made the wrong one. And in the alternate universe, the other decision, she came, you know, became successful or whatever. Okay. Devlin, I'm not your husband. I'm another version of I'm from another universe. I'm here because we need your help. Very busy today. Uh, no time to help you. Across the multiverse, I've seen thousands of Evelyns. You can access all the memories, their emotions, even the skills. So Evelyn, as you just mentioned, she dreams of being an actress in, in our main mm. real universe. Well, our main universe. She always dreamt of being an actress and uh, she feels she grew up with intense pressure to live up to her father's older traditions. You know, she's uh, her and Waymond moved from China and her father is a very old fashioned Chinese man. And I I know families growing up that are similar in across many different nationalities, and these older generations tend to be more sort of like hard assed in a way. Um, mm -hmm. And we see a moment when she she's having memories of her life, and she sees a moment where she's actually just come out of the womb, and the doctor says to her father, "I'm sorry, it's a girl." And it's kind of funny, but not at the same time, because you realize like in these old traditional societies, like women were, and, and probably still in some cases are like looked down upon and like, it, it, yeah. every, like, they every, don't really want you having girls. In well, China. right. And every man wants to have a, a boy because they want to, you know, carry on their name and like their family history. Mm -hmm. And it's like all this like stupid traditional shit that I don't agree with, but you know, that's the way it is. Um, but she basically moves away from China with Waymond and, uh, he chooses to open the laundromat when we see that in this vision, he's the one excited about it. And she's kind of like, oh, OK. Um, and it was all despite her father's disapproval. We get more detail later in the movie that, um, you know, the dad, Gong Gong, he never wanted her to move away. And he was just basically a hard ass on her her whole life. So she's living with this constant um, lifelong feeling of never being enough for her father never never having excuse me her father's approval right and unfortunately she uh carries that over to her relationship with her daughter joy oh god waymond is just <laughs> he just fucking breaks my heart dude because he's just such a nice guy and he again he he's is. he's happy living the simple life he finds joy in anything he can he explains this later in the movie that the way like that how he fights is by being kind and he says there's so much shit in this world so many fucked up things he's like this is the way that i know how to fight it and he also sees the value in being a small local laundromat when they first go to the irs agency her dad's given her shit and he's kind of like oh it's nice to be uh what he say? it's nice to be needed like by the community, yeah. he means. There's that little moment in the beginning of the film where she's looking for the customer's clothes. And he's like, oh, I moved them upstairs. I think they'd be happier there. And he's like, oh, look, yeah. see, they're happier up here. Puts the eyeballs on everything. Yeah, so he just has this perspective of just like, find the happiness in everything. Which I really love about him. But speaking on the tension between Evelyn and Joy, Evelyn's not really disapproving of her daughter's relationship with, what's her girlfriend's name in the film? Um... Becky. She doesn't disapprove of the relationship, but she's still kind of a little embarrassed by it. Yeah, because it's her The traditions, yeah. yeah. She she says to, when she introduces Becky to her father, she says in Chinese, Becky's a very good friend. And of course, uh, Joy gets very offended and kind of storms off. Um, but I think Evelyn doesn't really know how to relate to her daughter or like nurture her because she was never taught that from her own father and she, and she moved away at a young age. So, um, you know, it's not necessarily her fault per se, 
but you get why Joy is. Yeah, you she's know, living in the depravity upset. of mm -hmm. of disapproval and the the shadow of the cold shoulder. She's yeah, and she's passing that along a little bit to her daughter because yeah, for sure. And her daughter Joy feels that she doesn't. Her mom doesn't see or respect her really, and mm -hmm. she's very overwhelmed with like her mom being sort of like a hard ass and also really being i guess just a human being in general in the modern world with modern technology because there's a lot of subtext of that there as well uh, but i really wanted to make sure we describe the characters because it's important for the rest of the film but essentially uh while we're exploring these multiverses we find out that joy is actually the villain of the film well villain this villain version of joy is from the alpha verse and she's basically Neo because of all these experiments that Alpha Evelyn did on her. Alpha Evelyn was a scientist, by the way. She's the one who discovered the multiverse and discovered the technology to cross over to other multiverses. And she does these experiments on Alpha Joy. And because of all the testing, she kind of like overburdens her brain. And now Joy has the ability to basically, she's Neo. She controls the multiverse. She cracked her teapot. Yeah, she's the real fucking Kang. We were talking about mm -hmm. Kang. She's the real fucking Kang. She could go. She so she basically Joy Alpha Joy experiences literally everything everywhere all at once. She's constantly experiencing every possible variation all the time. And uh, this is actually represented in the film by this bagel, uh, the everything yeah. bagel that that Joy ends up creating. And she explains, Had to be made. yeah, she explains like. I wanted to see what would happen if I piled fucking everything possible onto this bagel. And like I said, there's a lot of subtext for real life here too. It's like, you know, dealing with technology. Like we as people, we deal with literally everything everywhere all at once. I could pick up my phone and I have instant access to everything everywhere all at once. I have all the information at my fingertips. And I don't yep. think in everyday life we, real, we don't realize how that actually affects us psychologically. We're seeing how it affects society psychologically. Correct. But it's certainly not a positive thing on our brains. I don't think the human brain is evolved enough to really deal with that amount of information. But that's a conversation for a different time. But, th but th this is all represented in the movie by this bagel and by what Joy is actually feeling. Evelyn is essentially placing her hopes and dreams and disappointments on Joy and just the way her father did to her. And Joy has a hard time kind of expressing that to Evelyn because, and it causes that, that tension that we see throughout the film. She's got a hole in her heart like that. The mm -hmm. bagel kind of represents that too. Is cause yeah. yearning, yearning for that, that love and that guidance from the, you know, the paternal figure, neither of them really had it because right. one was, you know, a brooding traditionalist and the other yep. one was, in the shadow of that despair, so... Yeah, a villain named, by the way, Jobu Tuba Tupaki, which there's some funny yes. moments in that where she's... Evelyn mispronounces it a lot, and she calls her, like, Jojo Chewbacca or some shit. There's some funny right. stuff there, but... Um, but this version of Joy, her mind is split, basically, in that way. She's being pulled in so many, like, wild directions to the point where that it gets to be too much. And by the end of the film, you realize that Jobu had really nothing to lose after that discovery and feeling the weight of the multiverse pressing in and that's why she created the bagel she threw her you know experiences thoughts just about everything she could think of on top of the bagel um wanting to discover what would happen if all that chaos was in one place as she describes it to evelyn what she ultimately found out is that despite the entirety of the multiverse and all that was in it nothing really mattered at all and she says this a few times throughout the movie that you know all of this stuff like nothing matters the ultimate question of life yep and it's why she wanted to succumb to everything no to, to i'm sorry to the everything bagels power that she yeah. wanted it was basically a black hole like visually in the movie and she wanted to jump into it and take evelyn with her but you know a big part of her journey is learning that there's still hope and that even though nothing matters there are certain things like in the film a mother-daughter relationship that are still worth fighting for or the little things in life, right? And there's this really great moment in the film too, where they end up jumping to a universe where, um, where the the conditions for life were never met on Earth, and they're just two rocks. Oh yeah, the rocks. Yeah, and it's they're great scene. and they're just sitting there staring out into like just this, you know, just nature and nothingness. Like, just, there's no humanity. Rock formations. Yeah. And it's just fucking 
text dialogue. There's silence. And there, it's Evelyn and Joy talking to each other. And um, it was just that it's a beautiful moment. And there's, there's no speech or anything. And it's pretty crazy how they had that worked out. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but, uh, but, um, I don't know how I felt about it being completely silenced. I mean, I guess it kind of hits a little bit on the conversation because you're focused on, but you'd expect like maybe some wind noises or something. There was a little bit. Yeah. You hear the breeze, but when I say silence, I mean, there's no like spoken dialogue and right. it's basically, I think it's what you said. I think the the goal was to just have the audience like focus on the dialogue itself because it's very important. It's Jobu telling Evelyn like, you know, like human beings are small and insignificant. We're fucking like these stupid fucking creatures on this fucking rock ball that are here by right. accident. <clears throat> and like, you know, early in our history, the majority of people believe that the sun was the center of all things. And they would yep. kill people that argued otherwise. And then she she says, uh, there, there's a really great line, every new discovery is just a reminder that we're all small and stupid. Um, yep. But again, it really drives home that message of the film of like, we're so fucking insignificant on the grand scale of the universe that nothing actually matters except for the things that matter, Right. Which I guess is subjective, Correct. but it's putting an objective spin on it. Like the things that matter are friendship and family and like those relationships with loved ones because we're here for a, a small blip of time. The fleeting moments of your own life. Yes. Yeah. Yep. A uh, beautiful message for sure. There's a great evil spreading throughout the many verses. And you may be your only chance of stopping it. Don't make me fight you. I am really good. I don't believe you. Wow, that was really good. The primary Evelyn, you know, she's all full of regret, as we said, about the decisions that she didn't make in life. And um, Stifled by it, actually, yeah. Yeah, and she, she lives this life that she didn't necessarily see for herself and her feelings. She has these feelings of inadequacy. Um, and regret. Yeah. Yep. And those haunt her quite a bit. And, but you know, so I think those are where the main tensions come from with her and Waymond and her and joy. I think they come from within her, right? How could you be happy with others if you're not happy with yourself? We find out also in the film that alpha Waymond chooses Evelyn to save the multiverse. He says to her, because she's so bad at everything that she's capable of anything. And again, the first time watching this, I didn't quite that, that conversation didn't quite land on me. Right. But essentially no other Evelyn's could understand what Jobu Tubaki was going through because their feelings of desolation weren't there. They were all doing the thing that they set out to do. Right. Right. So they all had more of a purpose than she did. She right. was the least purpose yep. or duty driven one of them all. So yeah. yeah. So in the alpha verse, alpha Evelyn was so hard on her daughter. So purpose driven that. Yeah. Yep. And it's something that, that our main Evelyn was able to relate to because she had been the same with our main joy. And she ca she also carries her own familial trauma with her own father, disowning her after she married Waymond. And those emotions are what allow her to sort of, you know, fight Jobu Tupaki um, on a level playing field, in a sense. You know, ultimately, all someone had to do was believe that Evelyn could do something extraordinary, which Alpha Waymond did, seeing beyond what she saw in herself to make her the perfect choice to, you know, bring the multiverse back into balance. So yeah, I mean, there's a ton of fucking like below the surface symbolism in this movie and subtext and stuff. But ultimately, as we talked about a little bit, none of that really matters because like underneath all that stuff is just that really simple story about like appreciating the little things in life and like why you should appreciate those little things that like really nothing does matter. You know, if you owe money to the fucking IRS, like who fucking cares? You could fucking get hit by a bus tomorrow. Like it doesn't matter. Uh, one thing I found it really interesting that uh, the daughter's name is Joy. Because I noticed again on my second viewing, throughout the movie, Evelyn says a lot of things like my saying my joy. She's trying to save her joy, trying to find her joy. And she's also looking for the joy that isn't a person, the joy in her own life, right? 
And in the end, the true joy in her life is her daughter, who, whose name is Joy, and also Waymond. I thought that was just kind of like, oh, obviously it's done on purpose, but it, right. the way they bring it home is like, you know, Evelyn has searched her entire life in our main universe to find meaning and like shed this regret that she's had and all this stuff when ultimately, you know, she finds out that like, it's just, you know, her family that, that matters to her and, and that's what she wants to nurture. Uh, there is a moment in this fucking movie, dude. And you know, I'm a crier. I talk about it a lot. There is a fucking moment in this movie where I almost, I, I think I've never cried before. The only, this is the, the only thing that this competes with is when Cap was dancing with Peggy at the end of Endgame. <laughs> Cause in the, well, when that happened, I was like a fucking wreck. This was similar in that, and that's in the universe where she's basically Michelle Yeoh and she's a famous martial artist, Waymond, who oh, yeah. is seemingly successful, has come to her show or come to her, the premiere of her newest film as, oh, you wonder what if we would have been fucking living above a laundromat worrying about laundry and taxes. And then he goes on this little conversation about how, you know, he he thinks it's important to be kind and forgiving and all the yeah. fucking God, dude. It is like, oh man, just... It's about the little stuff. The waterfalls, life, bro. Life is fleeting. Yeah. But just to him, it's like, yeah, that'd have been great. Just doing laundry and taxes. Fuck it. Like, we don't... Why, why do you need anything else? But yeah, man, I fucking love this movie. It's hands down, and it's probably in my top five, for sure. Like, of all time favorite movies at this point. It's just a great all-around movie. Like you said, it's all about the little things. You know, you have been called a nihilist before in conversations where it's like, nothing matters. Yep, yeah. Those who uh, love the most regret the most, but there's nothing wrong with having a little grit in yeah, your life. Yeah, that's a line out of the movie. Who says that? Uh... I don't remember who said it. Might have been Jamie I just Lee. Remember it. I no, remember. maybe it was Wayman. I don't know. But yeah, it's a I great think it was line. Wayman, but yeah, it's a great line. Um, yeah, a beautiful movie. Sh uh, you know, credit to the Daniels because, I mean, it, it's just such a creative and f like movie, like in every aspect of it. Like it's imaginative. And this and is one if you like didn't really like it because you didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. If you watch it a second time, you might actually. Yeah you know, like it more. So I loved it, it the first time, chance. but now I'm yeah. like obsessed and I was obsessed before. Actually, that's not fair to say. Actually, it's funny. My buddy George just messaged me the other day. He was like, I think I have to file for a divorce. Meanwhile, he just got married like last summer and he's, I was like, why would happen? He's like, Oh, I tried to sit down with Jen, his wife to watch everything everywhere all at once. And like about an hour in, she made me turn or half hour in, she made me turn it off. She said she didn't like it. I was like, damn. And then he messaged me again last night. He's like, fucking movie just cleaned up at the Oscars and she still doesn't want to watch it. <laughs> She's like, papers are filed. Yeah. But yeah, I, I could totally understand why this movie wouldn't be for everybody, but all I say is that if you haven't, excuse me, if you haven't watched it yet, give it a chance. Um, it's got an 8.0 on IMDb right now. And uh, listen, a movie that could make two rocks looking out onto a beautiful view. Emotional. Of other rocks. Yeah. yeah. If a movie can make that emotional, it's worth a 10 for me, baby. Perfect score. Let's go. Oh, my gosh. Yep. No. The second uh, one. That's wild. This no, is the second one I've yeah, given. Well, it's really, no honestly... This thing is a perfect movie for me. But. The, honestly, I believe this is the perfect movie. Because, you know, for our conversations, I always go into stuff looking for little nitpicky shit that I could talk about. There is not a thing in this movie that I would change. Not a thing in this movie that I dislike. Not a thing in this movie that... I think doesn't fit. I really do believe it's like the perfect movie. Yeah. I, I, uh, nine is the highest mark I think I'll ever give in this whole series. So that's my 10, I guess. And I don't know for this one, I think it hits all the marks, except I'm not sure about the rewatchability. I don't know if this is one after the hundredth time, I'll still walk away and say, Yes, that is definitely a nine mm -hmm. out of ten. So for that, I'll give it an eight and a half. Okay. We're no longer friends. And I, 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 you know, I watched it. I, this is the third time I've seen it. Uh, I watched it, and mm -hmm. then I was like, oh, yeah, we're, we, we, should, you know, let's review this for sure. Yeah. Then watched it again when we reviewed it, and mm -hmm. then watched it again just now. So The measure for me, mm -hmm. 
is whether or not the emotional beats still have the same impact on me a lot of the time is how I would gauge it. Um, maybe it's a stupid measuring stick, but... It, well, that varies depending on your mood, though, doesn't it? Like, Not really. The, one, the things that really get me going, like, generally will always get me going. For instance, I mentioned Cap dancing with Peggy. Mm -hmm. I will cry every single time. I, if I think about Captain America, I cry. Okay, so there's that. But <laughs> <laughs> because of that scene. Yeah. So, right. like, that will always do that for me. Same with some other little things like, you know, I love you 3000 and like just the little things that movie did so well. And this is one of those movies for me as I was watching it a second time, I went into it wondering like, huh, am I going to get emotional at the same places that I did since it's no longer a surprise to me? And sure enough, I did like it works. So I don't think that will change, but um, yeah, I don't know. Love it. Perfect movie. Go watch it if you haven't mm -hmm. seen it. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. So remember, folks. Once again, I'm going to quote it. Every new discovery is just a reminder that we're all small and stupid. So be kind and cherish the small speck of time we get. Remember that, folks. That's right.